This is CBC Here and Now. It's Friday. We've got a couple of systems affecting us, one tropical and one wintry. Drums are beating on the west coast for the Halibu's new enterprise. Someone needs to step up to the plate. I just can't sit by any longer. Stepping up and stepping back into politics. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. Former Newfoundland and Labrador Premier Paul Davis wants to return to politics. This time he's aiming to run in a federal election. But first, he has to win the Conservative Party nomination for the Avalon District. And he's not the only one who wants it. Here and Now's Mark Quinn reports. Paul Davis retired from politics two years ago. But he says his concern about the state of the province's economy in general and sectors like the oil industry in particular have drawn him back in. People are out of work, they don't know what's in the future. And we have a federal government who is not stepping up to the plate. But already he's facing some friction from the Conservative Party's grassroots members. Davis announced his intention to seek the party's nomination on Facebook without letting the Avalon District Association know first. And now the president of the association has taken a leave of absence. When you have a district association that's active, that's your grassroots, that's your people on the ground. And it's a general consensus that uh, if we're on the ground, then our opinion should matter. And it didn't seem like it really did in this instance. Davis says he's surprised the district association is speaking publicly about this. Many of them are supporters of the other candidate. Uh, so it's not unusual, as I said, for a, a candidate to have their own supporters on a district association. It happens provincially, it happens federally, it's not unique uh, to Avalon as well. So I'm a little bit surprised that they're, uh, they're airing their dirty laundry publicly uh, or their views on that because some of them have been open arms, welcoming and encouraged me uh, to be in the process. Matthew Chapman is the other Avalon candidate. He ran in the district for the Conservatives in the last federal election. I believe that the, you know, the membership and the people of Avalon are going to recognize that I ran when nobody else would. I called to be a volunteer and I ended up becoming the candidate. Chapman says he's working hard to secure the nomination again. And he expects the nomination vote will happen sometime before the end of this year. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Conception Bay South. Much different story today across the province. In fact, or at least across the island, seven degrees was the afternoon high in St. John's, considering yesterday it was 18 degrees. So much cooler across the board. Nine degrees in Cornerbrook today, three in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Then we've got those temperatures uh, pretty similar up through uh, the northern portions of Labrador as well. So the reason for that is we've got this rigid high pressure that's keeping things quite calm. You can see some of that cloud cover down creeping further north. That is what is now Hurricane Epsilon and as we head through the night tonight, we've got a warm front that's going to lift up through Labrador. So we're looking at some snow overnight tonight. Snowfall warning in effect for Churchill Falls and the valley. You could see upwards of 10 to 15 centimeters of snow and this will mix with ice pellets at some point tonight and then eventually change over to rain. But I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, some people from Sheshashi finished a long walk this week. For the first time, residents organized a memorial walk, one that spanned from Happy Valley Goose Bay all the way to the First Nation. The inspiration? Marking the memory of those lost along that highway over the years. Well, for me, it was 11 hours. The others uh, got there early. At first, it was easy. Yeah. And after we passed nine miles and then it got harder. My father died on the road at nine miles. And I want to do something for him, to remember him. He went to get some wood. It was winter and it was very cold at our house. And after he was done, he wanted to get one more wood and that's when he fell and he passed away there. He was a good father to me and my brother. 
but my sisters don't remember him. Yeah. I lost an aunt and my cousins in a, a vehicle accident and it was um, at the bridge and um, I think uh, the driver lost control due to, uh, due to the icy conditions on the bridge. My aunt was very involved in the community. She was uh, one of the, the leaders within her group and um, also played a big role within church events and, and uh, in other community events. That's one of the things that's also sad about it is that we don't have um, a lot of elders in our community. And, uh, and here she was, like, played a big role in, in the community. They talk about like the roads being unsafe, that the roads need to, they need to do better upkeep on, on the roads and maybe they need to change, I don't know, but it's just like you say that over and over again and, and at the end of the day you, you, you think like some of those accidents, could they have been avoided? The people who passed away on that road, there were 13 Inno people. I'm sure they're watching over us, and I'm sure they're proud they have their day to be remembered. Well, to the West Coast now, in Corner Brook today, there was music, smudging, and cause for celebration. The Halibu First Nation is getting into the seal business. The Mi'kmaq Band launched a brand new uh, brand of seal oil capsules this morning. It's called Waspu, the Mi'kmaq word for seal. The capsules will be distributed by Coleman's locally, but there are plans to bring the product to national and international markets. While there are restrictions on seal products, there are also exceptions for indigenous organizations. Entered into uh, um, a supply development and, a, and I guess a private label agreement with Carino, which is a really well established uh, seal processing company here in the province. So um, all that end of it is, is handled through that company. Uh, we essentially uh, you know, purchase the product from them. Um, uh, we, we, we provide the bottles, we got to have our own label and logo and all those kinds of things and you know, we're certainly undertaking you know, most of our own marketing and distribution as well. well no new cases of COVID-19 to report in the province today. There are still nine active cases in Newfoundland and Labrador. And following yesterday's case in Central, the province has issued a warning for recent travelers. Anyone who was traveling on Air Canada Flight 7484 from Toronto to Deer Lake last Monday, that's October the 12th, should call 811 to arrange testing. A major Canadian fashion retailer is going bust. Le Chateau the, is the latest retail victim of COVID-19. Le Chateau has been in business for 60 years and has 123 locations across Canada, including here in this province. About 1,400 employees work for the company. It's seeking court protection from its creditors while it winds down operations and liquidates its assets. It's the latest Canadian brand to fold during the COVID pandemic. Others include Reitman's, David's Tea, outdoor clothing company Mech, and the fashion chain that owns Ricky's, Clio, Bootlegger, and Aldo. The pandemic affects all aspects of life, and while it's no secret charities have been hit hard, it's been particularly difficult for smaller, lesser known nonprofits. They function quietly without a national or provincial spotlight and don't really have many resources. Here and now, Cease Hare visited two small local charities to find out how they're doing. The Old Methodist Schoolhouse in Adams Cove, Conception Bay North, is a registered heritage structure that survives because of a local nonprofit run by passionate volunteers. The Adams Cove Community Hall Group is a continuation of a committee that helped build this school in 
1910 because there was a need for uh, a larger schoolhouse and so there's been a continuous committee in place for about 110 years and basically looks after the building and the structure and we are a continuation of that. A few years back, the nonprofit revived an old tradition that was common, the Fall Harvest Festival. It was the group's annual fundraiser and included a dinner following an auction of locally made Christmas cakes, locally grown vegetables, and salt codfish. Normally generating three to $4,000, this year it's cancelled. We rely heavily on our volunteers to cook the meal and to stand in the kitchen side by side and prepare the meal to have it delivered. And so uh, it's almost impossible to have any type of social distancing uh, that it seems to be appropriate uh, in this environment. The impact is really we don't have any extra money to do some needed upgrades and upkeep on the building because as we are a heritage building we do have to try and get certain things done to bring it back into the, some of the standards of, of the period of the time period. It's a similar story on the other side of the Hearts Content Barrens, another small nonprofit that's struggling in Trinity Bay. The Hearts Content Mizzen Heritage Society has a performing arts center inside a 142-year-old church on the main road, which was a happening spot before COVID-19. We had had 25 concerts. We had had uh, as many, again, uh, open mic coffee house evenings. We uh, had a lot of rentals. We had anniversary celebrations here. The society also owns a museum and a blacksmith forge. Arnett says the lost revenue from the concert venue isn't the only challenge facing small groups like his. Small groups like ours, I think uh, volunteer burnout is a big issue and uh, you know getting the number of volunteers that you need to operate these buildings and do the uh, things you want to do that's that's uh, that's a big challenge arnett says as far as the future goes they're facing a great unknown the short term he says looks pretty good they have enough money to keep them going until the spring the long term he's a little more optimistic about it because there are plans underway to have the cable station declared a unesco world heritage site cease here cbc news Heart's content. Last week, we reported that Ocean Choice International will adapt its plans for Long Pond Harbor and Conception Bay South. The company wants to build a new wharf and cold storage facility, but the project is controversial. Last week's announcement didn't come with any details, but now the details are out, and the CBC's Adam Walsh has more. The details came out in a media release this morning. What will happen is the plan is being shifted to the southwest in the harbor. What that is doing, it's putting it closer to the traditional industrial side of things. These changes were in part to get the OK from Transport Canada for safe navigation. And according to OCI, after listening to input from people in the area, OCI President Blaine Sullivan had this to say about the shift. Quote, over the last several weeks, we have been meeting, listening, and answering questions from individuals who have shown an interest in our proposed development in Long Pond Harbor. Taking into consideration some of the things we heard throughout this process, as well as feedback from the Navigable Waters Division of Transfer Canada, we have made some adjustments to our development plan. The community group advocates for the responsible development of Long Pond was opposed to the plan as is and has called for an environmental assessment. That fact has not changed. Members of that group who I spoke with today say they're still calling for an environmental assessment. And one person who I spoke to said after looking at the plans, he doesn't think much has changed at all. Adam Walsh, CBC News, Conception Bay South. A man whose house has been the focal point of a homicide investigation will soon find out his sentence for threatening a police officer in March of last year. The Crown wants a suspended sentence for Kurt Churchill, plus probation and an order to collect his DNA. The defense is against the DNA order and says Churchill should receive a conditional discharge. Churchill was convicted of telling an RNC officer he would put a boot in his head. He was intoxicated on George Street at the time. Well, today at court, Churchill told the judge he had no recollection of what happened, but if he scared or intimidated the officers, he apologized. Churchill owns a home on Craig Miller Avenue that has been searched by police in the James Cody homicide investigation. Cody was found shot to death on the street in July. No charges have been laid in that case. 
Well, a man who overdosed on methadone has led to charges for a suspected dealer. In May, police responded to someone overdosing in St. Lawrence. He, his condition was life-threatening and he was airlifted to hospital. The RCMP investigated and yesterday charged a 41-year-old with trafficking and criminal negligence causing bodily harm. The man who's from St. Lawrence has been released on conditions but is due back in court next month. Well, we heard about nonprofits earlier in the show, how they're struggling through the pandemic. Well, the SPCA is pretty well known, but it's dealing with some extra strain. Two break-ins in less than one month. That's what the SPCA thrift shop in St. John's is up against. Someone smashed through their front door earlier this week, but as you'll see, the first break-in may be even more unnerving. We had one of our front doors completely smashed out. Thankfully, they didn't receive anything of significant value. Um, we did put, you know, some more safety measures in place after our break in in September um, with regards to, you know, our safe and things like that, because uh, the last time in September, they did manage to get our entire safe. We actually believe that the individual was probably in the store before we had closed um, and hid until we had left. Uh, so obviously, we put measures in place so that that would hopefully not happen next time. And thankfully they worked, um, but they did actually still get away with quite a few donations and stuff that, you know, we ultimately would have sold and made money to uh, put towards the shelter. Uh, but it definitely could have been worse. I think the biggest thing um, that we've struggled with now is just trying to, you know, pay for the damages and things that were caused. It's a bit of a tough pill to swallow considering, you know, everything that um, has been going on pandemic wise and, you know, just trying to keep things in business. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot to take on being the second time that's been in break ends since September. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty tough, but we're trying to stay in positive spirits. And uh, it's funny that I actually, um, we kind of had a heartwarming thing happen yesterday and I really think I should share. One of our volunteers actually found a bird, which turned out to be a petrel outside. Normally, they, if they get sort of stranded, that they're not around water, they can't fly, and they kind of just are stuck there. So we actually had it um, inside of the store, and at the end, they actually one of our volunteers brought them to uh, Middle Cove Beach to actually be released in the water. So it's a kind of a nice thing to say, you know, despite everything that's going on, it's like the volunteers never stop thinking about what we're there for, and the most important thing is the animals. So... You know, despite it all, I think it's just, you know, they're doing a really great job. We're a very small but mighty team, and it's um, it's a really, really great place to, um, to get involved for anybody who, you know, might be interested. I hope so.
I'm Ram Raj Shravendran, the co-host of the St. John's Morning Show. I want to let you know about a series we've been working on here at CBC NL. It's called NL in Color. I got a chance to sit down with folks that live right here in St. John's that don't always look and sound like the people around them. I'd be excited eating like mac and cheese and, <laughs> and fish and brews. The need to belong is less important to me. People are going to think that brown people don't know what a crosswalk is. They think you come from, I don't know, where. We've already given them so much, how can they ask for more? I was absolutely floored. You can tune in right here on Here and Now or on CBC Radio 1 or even online, cbc.ca slash NL. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. Take the time to explore this fall. Learn more at stayhomeyear.ca. Looking forward to seeing Ramraj on our newscast. Me too. It looks like a very interesting series that he's going to be doing. Yes, it does, for sure. In color. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we're at the weekend now, and you mentioned earlier that there's going to be a mix of weather on the way. We do. We have a tropical system affecting us over the weekend, and then also some snow up through portions of Labrador. But uh, wow, today was different. Was it not? <laughs> it was a shock to the system. Yeah. <laughs> you definitely needed a jacket when you walked out the door <laughs> yeah. today. Look at the temperatures uh, only reaching a high near 7 degrees in St. John's today. And then uh, similar temperatures really across the board. The warm spot uh, or the warm temperature, the warmest temperature we saw today was 9 degrees. And a few of us saw that this afternoon. Temperatures cool up through Labrador as well, only reaching a high near minus two in Lab City and currently still sitting there and uh, a lot of us have dropped in those temperatures through the day as well. Five degrees right now in St. John's and then we've got a temperature near eight degrees in Corner Brook. So the reason for that is a ridge of high pressure bringing in that cooler air. And uh, we've got the next system rolling in. That's uh, a low pressure system. A warm front's going to lift as we head through the overnight tonight. And that is going to bring some snow for portions of Labrador. So if I step out here, you can see that work its way through. As we head into the overnight, uh, into the early morning hours, we'll see a transition through to ice pellets for Lab West and then quickly transition to rain. But not before about 5 to as much as 15 centimeters of snow will fall for you. That'll work its way towards the interior of Labrador as well well as coastal areas as we head into the early morning hours again in between uh, in behind that that will quickly change over to rain so Ridge high pressure still very much dominating the weather across the islands. So we're looking at uh, a cool night in those lower elevations, likely seeing temperatures dipping below zero and uh, the winds will stay generally light tonight. So um, one to as much as two uh, degrees, maybe even about five degrees down through Port of Basque and then hovering uh, below zero up through more, most of Labrador as well. So Happy Valley Goose Bay, you're looking at a low near minus two tonight. So that ridge of high pressure is going to slide out and we've got that uh, low affecting the uh, Labrador coast. And then there's that rain transition for you in Happy Valley Goose Bay into the afternoon. You'll see that towards the coast as well. Then for the island, the clouds will be on the increase through the day. And this is thanks to Hurricane uh, Epsilon. Lawn. That's going to bring in that cloud cover and gusty winds as well. As we head into the evening hours, that's when we'll start to see the rain move in, which will likely be heavy at times, certainly for the east, maybe even towards central as well, depending on the exact track. Uh, but we could pick up anywhere from 20 to as much as 40 millimeters of rain, some pockets of 50, certainly possible uh, in some of that heavier rain. But mainly this looks like it'll affect eastern portions of, uh, of the island with less than 10 uh, millimeters of rain as you head further west. But overall temperatures should rebound into the double digits tomorrow. But again, those gusty winds out of the southeast, uh, anywhere from say 50 to as much as 60 kilometers per hour. Some exposed areas may see gusts a little bit higher than that. But most of the afternoon should actually be fairly nice until that cloud cover moves in and then eventually that rain. And then up through Labrador, you're looking at your temperatures uh, back up into the double digits for Happy Valley Goose Bay, which is why you'll see that transition from snow through to ice pellets and then eventually rain and similar uh, story across the coast, except you're looking at uh, temperatures only reaching the single digits through the day. So there's the hurricane. Like I said, going to pass well south of us uh, into the overnight on Sunday, uh, Saturday into Sunday. And then Sunday afternoon actually looks fairly nice. Should clear out a few pockets of sunshine. And then on the western portion of the island, the temperatures are going to stay cool. So you're more than likely going to see the potential for some flurries and flurry activity uh, for Labrador as well through the day. Then another ridge of high pressure will move in on Monday. 
and it's actually looking like a fairly nice day on Monday, but those uh, shower activities will or flurry activities rather will continue for most of Labrador. Temperatures rebounding again, so about 11 degrees for St. John's. There's that four degree temperature for Corner Brook, so the flurry potential certainly in the higher elevations towards the uh, surface. We may see a few uh, showers with that and then hovering anywhere from one to three degrees for Labrador, a little bit cooler in the west and that will continue as you head into Monday, but there it is. Uh, even though these temperatures are well below where we should be sitting for this time of year, sunshine will make it feel fairly nice. And then that uh, rebounding temperature again, much of a roller coaster for Tuesday. 12 degrees will be the afternoon high. And then Wednesday, we're right back down to those single digits yet again. And it does look a little bit unsettled as we head into midweek next week. And then for uh, central uh, Newfoundland, you're looking at a similar drop in temperatures, four or five degrees. And this is when some snow will start to make its way into the forecast. Wet snow at this point, but still that potential for sure. And then same thing for western Newfoundland with a, a temperature near four degrees as well. Overnight lows dipping near or just below the zero degree mark. For Eastern Labrador, you're looking at uh, once you get tomorrow's 10 degrees out of the way, it's going to be fairly chilly. Uh, however, nice with some sunshine Tuesday, the chance of a few flurries and then into Wednesday, it's looking like we'll see plenty of sunshine. However, that's not the case for Lab West. Temperatures well below zero, uh, certainly into the overnight hours. And we are looking at some uh, accumulating snow possible again into the middle of next week. So I wanted to share this beautiful photo from Hopedale. We don't often get photos there. Thank you so much for sharing that lovely shot with us, Amy. And if you have any weather photos that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Beautiful. It's gorgeous. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yes. Well, call it a thrillogy. For <laughs> the third year in a row, a dental clinic in paradise is creeping out its patients by making its own Halloween horror. Yeah, and as if the dentist wasn't scary enough, mm -hmm. uh, this time the man in the mask is back and he doesn't want to fill out any forms. Take a look. Nice. <laughs> that was a pretty good mask, it actually. It was, yeah. It was very nice. Yeah, that was uh, from the crew that is appropriately called Grind Mind and uh, Kelly Hines' uh, Dentistry in Paradise. We were about a year into the company when COVID struck, and that's when we decided to make the pivot. A St. John's company focused on women's health and breaking stigmas shifts gears during the pandemic. We'll hear how they went from creating lifelike models of female anatomy to nasal swabs. That's coming up.
It's Innovation Week in the province, and there's one St. John's company that stands out in its drive to innovate during a pandemic. You could say they're breaking the mold by making the mold. Granville Biomedical uses 3D printing to create realistic models of female anatomy. So before we move on, I just want to give you a heads up that we're about to show you examples of those products. The molds are designed to be as lifelike as possible for education and medical training training purposes, but the company is also using its technology on another front. It designed a nasal swab for COVID-19 testing. Granville Biomedical was co-founded by Christine Gowdy, who's originally from Mount Pearl, and she joins me now. So can you start by telling us the idea behind your company? We design anatomical models that enhance healthcare training, advance patient education, and also innovate device demonstration. Um, people just need more hands-on training because there's an emphasis on patient safety. So the more that we can increase uh, collaboratively around the world, increase that hands-on training, um, the safer we'll be as patients when we go in to have procedures done. And also the more um, confidence our practitioners will have when they perform procedures on our bodies. And uh, in the whole realm of women's health, I just feel like there was a lot of stigma and there still is and a lot of um, a lot of questions surrounding conditions that affect women, devices that can help us and, and also for the healthcare practitioners to practice hands-on skills. So that's kind of where it all started and, and the vulva models that we create basically allow people to do that. So we wanted to create a very respectful, um, you know, dignified line of products that people feel comfortable to learn with. and. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of practitioners, you know, turning to the sex industry to look at sex toys to use as training tools. And we felt like that just that just doesn't really uh, fit the bill in terms of healthcare. We just feel like that was all almost a disservice to women's health. So people were choosing to use things like car washing sponges and cow tongues. And and they're still using those items to replicate female anatomy. And uh, I always joke and say, if this was a male problem, I don't think they'd be using paper towel holders and hot dogs to simulate male anatomy. So why are we accepting like good enough as, as something that's sufficient? So we're just looking at changing that, removing stigmas and just advancing healthcare in the simplest of, of ways. And now you've recognized a different kind of need. How did you go from making vulva models to nasal swabs? We were about a year into the company when COVID struck, and that's when we decided to make the pivot into designing the nasopharyngeal swabs. When the pivot happened, we were nervous as a new company. Um, we weren't sure what that was gonna mean for us. We designed 28 different swabs and we have put 11 through pretty rigorous validation testing. And so that has given us a lot of insight into what it would be like to apply this recipe to another medical device and keep innovating and keep creating new um, designs in the healthcare industry. So I think it's an exciting time. It's a big financial risk, but I think um, the future is bright. And what makes your nasal swab design so different than what's being used now? Yeah, so the gold standard swab that we traditionally have seen in healthcare, there's a major shortage of those internationally. And so those were the traditional cotton tip swabs that you've seen in healthcare. We started 3D printing prototypes of a swab that would be uh, cost effective and also as effective in terms of collecting a specimen sample as the traditional swabs that were in healthcare. And what comes next in the process of bringing the swab to market? Yeah, so the next kind of phase for us right now is we're looking at a clinical trial that's happening in Brazil in November with Health Canada. So we are very um, eager to be part of that clinical trial. And from there, we hope to go to market with the swabs and then launch them in a big way in December. We think that we can contribute a significant number of swabs to the healthcare industry, not only in, in Newfoundland, Labrador, but Canada, and also on a global platform as well. So we're ramping up production, we're scaling the company, and I think that's only gonna allow us to further innovate future projects and products and uh, take on bigger challenges as we move forward. Well, Christine Gowdy, good luck to you, and it's always nice to speak with a fellow Mount Pearlian. <laughs> For sure, thanks so much.
federal government is committing more than $200 million to help bolster Canada's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has announced Ottawa will use the money to support several Made in Canada vaccine projects. The government is providing up to $173 million for Medicago to advance their vaccine candidate and create a production facility in Quebec City. We have also reached an agreement with them to supply up to 76 million doses of their vaccine. This is about securing potential vaccines for Canadians while supporting good jobs in research. Ottawa is also providing more than $18 million to support a Vancouver company. $23 million will be spent on the development of six other vaccine candidates. Well, with the number of COVID-19 cases rising around the world, the head of the World Health Organization has a dire warning for countries in the Northern Hemisphere. We are at a critical juncture in this pandemic, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. The next few months are going to be very tough and some countries are on a dangerous track. We urge leaders to take immediate action to prevent further unnecessary deaths, essential health services from collapsing, and schools shutting again. As I said it in February, and I'm repeating it today, this is not a drill.
the Newfoundland couple who retired to a life of isolation on Labrador's north coast. Jim and Gladys Roberts, our next archival special, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Bellegarde is calling for the head of the RCMP to resign. It comes just days after Brenda Lucky defended the force's response to an ongoing dispute between Mi'kmaq and non-Indigenous lobster fishermen in Nova Scotia. In a statement released today, Bellegarde says... I will be writing to Prime Minister Trudeau to express that we have lost confidence in Royal Canadian Mounted Police Commissioner Brenda Lucky. I am asking the Prime Minister to remove Commissioner Lucky and to replace her with someone who will focus their attention on public safety and combating racism. Well, at a news conference later in the day, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked about Bellegarde's statement. Here's his response. The responsibility of the RCMP uh, is to keep Canadians safe. Um, we have uh, uh, seen uh, some challenges in Nova Scotia, uh, not just recently, but uh, uh, over the past uh, many months with the terrible tragedy uh, in uh, how the RCMP has uh, been able to deliver. But at the same time, uh, they continue uh, to serve Canadians day in, day out, right across the country. Uh, I've heard concerns uh, from many Canadians uh, about uh, the functioning of our national police force. We'll continue to listen to Canadians and work with uh, the chief uh, in terms of the commissioner uh, in terms of making sure that we continue to keep Canadians safe. Well, buying your first home is a big step in anyone's life. It's an even bigger step for people with intellectual disabilities. Travis Kingdon introduces us to a woman in Prince Edward Island who was determined to make it work. Hello. This is Janet Charchuk's first apartment. It would be a big deal for anyone, but for her, it means even more. It's something she's been working towards for her entire life. That was my dream. I always wanted to be able to live on my own. Charchuk is 37 and has an intellectual disability. Up until 2010, she was living with her parents, but when she decided it was time to move out, there was no support of housing in Alberton. And while those supports existed elsewhere, it was important to Charchuk that she stay in her community. My connections are really here. My mom and my dad, they live in Montrose. And if I were to move to Charlottetown, I won't be able to see them as often. And I do have friends. Yeah. And then Alberton House came along. The facility, run by Community Inclusions, opened its doors in 2010. It provides transitional and long-term housing for islanders with intellectual disabilities. If they grew up here or if they want to live in Alberton or Larry or wherever for that matter, that uh, they should have that opportunity and not have to leave their community, you know, for housing. A number of self-advocates worked with Community Inclusion to build the home, including Janet Charchuk. She got Alberton Town Council to rezone the land that the home now sits on. I actually feel pretty proud, and at the same time, I also felt like I made a real difference for people. But Alberton House wasn't the final stop for Charchuk. After six years, she decided it was time to make her dream come true. So she went to a local apartment building and put an application in, which came as a surprise to her mother, who was out of province at the time. So I think from the very beginning, Janet always surprised us and amazed us. You know, I was a bit surprised, but when I thought about it, no, that just fits right in with what she's going <laughs> to yeah. do. Now that Janet Charchuk is living alone, she hopes her journey shows people two things. The first, that islanders with intellectual disabilities can live independently. They just need to take it slow and find somewhere that can offer them the required support first. And most importantly... That they have the right to choose where they live. Travis Kingdon, CBC News, Charlottetown. Travelers coming into Canada through Alberta are getting a chance to shorten their time in quarantine. Right now, most people coming into the country are supposed to isolate for 14 days, but airlines and airports are hoping a pilot program that offers COVID-19 testing at the border will drastically reduce that burden. CBC's Carolyn Dunn has the details. There were fewer than a dozen passengers on a Dallas to Calgary flight 
Juan Lopez knows one reason. The Texan will be seeing his Canadian wife for the first time in seven months. But with isolation, he won't be getting too close. It's like 14 days, you got to kind of keep yourself separated with the mask on. And, and then you gotta, I got a couple days before I have to go back to Texas and back to work. But a new pilot project in Alberta holds some promise to fill the empty airport. Beginning in November, international passengers will have the option of taking a voluntary COVID test on arrival at Calgary's airport. And that has the potential to reduce the quarantine period from the mandatory 14 days down to as few as two. Once a passenger tests negative, they can leave isolation, provided they agree to a second test in a week and follow guidelines. So there will be appropriate controls to make sure that uh, we are actually following people, understanding if they're becoming symptomatic and doing the appropriate thing of isolating them should they become symptomatic. A recent study in Toronto of over 15,000 international passengers found 99% of them were negative for COVID. So struggling airlines are delighted at the idea of shortened isolation periods. This pivot is a health and science-based approach that WestJet and indeed all Canadian aviation have been waiting for. In self-isolation after a possible exposure to COVID himself, Premier Jason Kenney says it offers hope to people left jobless. And behind every one of those jobs, there is a family who's facing uncertainty and a person who needs to pay their mortgage. The testing study will also be available to people driving from the U.S. through the border crossing at Coots, Alberta. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary.
Time to find out who's celebrating. Congratulations to Chester and Shirley Murley of Creston North who are celebrating their 60th anniversary. Roger and Beatrice Beryl of Pasadena are celebrating their 50th anniversary. Congratulations. Happy 65th wedding anniversary to Lloyd and Jean Baker of St. John's. Anniversary greetings going out to Jack and Mary Budden of Stephenville. They're celebrating 62 years of marriage. Happy 59th anniversary to Bernard and Anita Howard of Gander. Happy anniversary to Jack and Velma Curtis who are celebrating their 60th. Happy 59th anniversary to Gerald and Aggie Costello of Bishop's Falls. Congratulations to Teresa and John Wall of Happy Valley Goose Bay, now living in St. John's. They're celebrating 66 years of marriage. Happy 56th wedding anniversary to Harold and Margaret O'Driscoll of Tours Cove. James and Nina Perry of Nippers Harbor, now living in St. John's, are celebrating their 54th anniversary. Anniversary greetings going out to David and Dulcie Churchill of Badger, who are celebrating their 50th anniversary anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary also to Bernard and Lori Cook. Congratulations to you. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Michael and Alice Mahoney of Colliers. It's a 64th anniversary for Jim and Marie Dix of Harbor Buffett, now living in Harbor Grace. Happy anniversary to Newman and Vila Harris. They're celebrating 57 years of marriage. Happy 61st anniversary to Irving and Delilah Filletry of Stephenville. Wishing Donna and Lou Hounsel of Clarenville a happy 56th anniversary. Happy 57th anniversary to Charlie and Clara of Mount Pearl. Happy anniversary to Wayne and Benita Perry Stanhope. It's their 52nd wedding anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary to Isa and Gerald Walsh of Roddington and Belle Island, now living in St. John's. Happy 60th anniversary to William and Fanny Taylor. Now to some birthdays. Albert Knoll is celebrating his 90th birthday. He lives in Carboneer. Birthday wishes going out to Bill Hiscock of Buren. He's turning 91. Wishing Frank White a happy 92nd birthday. He's from Greens Pond and now lives in Mount Pearl. Happy 91st birthday to Phyllis Viander of Fortune, now living in St. John's. Happy 93rd birthday to Randall Moulton of Winterland. Happy birthday to Joe West from Gander. He's turning 90. Wishing Woodrow Head a happy 93rd birthday. Happy birthday to Olive Hardy of Cartwright, Labrador, now living in CBS. It's her 94th birthday and happy birthday to Laura Milley, who is turning 95. Another fine crowd. Congratulations once again. Well, here is someone who is also celebrating a birthday, but in a very unusual way. This man credits CrossFit with keeping him steady on his feet. And CrossFit, if you've ever done it, it's no joke. It's high intensity. It's about deadlifts, push-ups, lunges. Yeah, but yeah. Bill <laughs> Mason doesn't mind. He celebrated his 96th birthday yesterday by going to the gym. I never heard of CrossFit before very recently. I have the need of something to do that is occupies my time and is interesting and that I can do and uh, this seemed uh, like a possible fit so I'm trying it out. Bill's a great guy. He came to us about a little over a month ago. Uh, his son had been training with us for a while and uh, he'd asked about his dad, who was you know, almost 96, doing the primetime class, which is our class for some of our older members. And I said, sure, come on in. I had a little stroke, actually, a couple of years ago, and that left me very wobbly. And I uh, figured out, finally, that part of the wobbliness was that I was very weak. And hopefully, uh, I'm getting strength, which will make me less wobbly on my feet. We've actually seen pretty significant progress with him, even in the last uh, five weeks. Like he has, you know, been using his cane a lot less, even through the workouts, uh, where he used to uh, have to hold on to a post and you know do any kind of dumbbell work. Now he's just standing free and clear of it and doing that. So it's been. Uh, the guy's amazing. 
a lot of these people are very much like me. They're not so different in age, and they all uh, handle themselves very well, uh, which uh, gives me hope that I might uh, handle myself as well as they do someday. He adds a lot, actually, because like, you've got like, one of our members was 70. She goes, oh my gosh, he's like 26 years older than me. And for all the rest of us, we can look at that. And I'm like, I just turned 52. And I look at him and say, OK, well, I've got 44 more years in me when you look at someone like that, hopefully. It seems to be working. And I think I'm going to continue with it. And that's, uh, I'm pleased with that. How do you feel when you finish a workout? Relieved and <laughs> pleased. R ready for a rest. <laughs> 96. If that's not inspiration to get to the gym, I don't know what is. Wow, and he had a small stroke. Incredible. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> well, thanks so much for joining us, everyone. It's Friday. Hope you have a wonderful weekend, and uh, thanks for watching. Good night. <laughs>